All right, so that's a pretty ambitious title here, Everything You Need to Know About the New SysP Exam. And, and I have to admit, that's a little bit of a marketing fluff. Uh, at the end of this 45 or 50 minutes, uh, if you were not prepared to take the SysP Exam before, uh, you won't quite be prepared uh, to take it after 45 or 50 minutes. But I would like to open it up to any questions about anything you need to know for that. So uh, I will be true to that. If there's any area, question, et cetera, of what you want to know, we'll bust out the slides or I'll do it from memory and we'll talk about it. But I want to give you an outline. Um, IC Squared has been doing a lot of changes. They went from paper-based tests to computer-based tests. Uh, they added scenario questions. Uh, they added the... Uh, drag and drop and hotspot questions. Most people don't even know what the heck a hotspot question is. I'll show you. Um, some people think they've added, you know, essays and fill in the blanks. And to my understanding, they have not. But I'll talk about that. They also revamped the entire common body of knowledge. How many domains are there at the CBK? Does anyone know? It's not ten anymore. It's eight now, right? Um, but you're just as right as he is because you know maybe there's eight domains instead of ten. It's pretty much the same CPK. I'll, I'll show you that, but I'll show you it's really a, just a little bit of a flash in the pan. The the real changes are um, how the questions are asked is a little bit of a change. The CBK has been increased a little bit, um, and we've gone to computer based. But really, not a lot has changed. Has anyone studied for the CISSP in the past or read any old books? Um, you could grab a CISSP book from seven or eight years ago, and that will give you enough information to pass the exam, right? Because from seven or eight years ago, what's new on the exam that wouldn't have been written in that book? Maybe a couple things about cloud, maybe little things about BYOD, but it's going to have almost everything else in it, right? So um, I'm not seeing huge changes, which is good news, right? Especially if you've already started studying. So here's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about the common body of knowledge itself and what the question's depth is, um, what kind of rigor will you need to know about each one of these areas. I'll talk about the new 2015 common body of knowledge and what's changed, uh, the new question formats, and then I'll give you my study strategies and test taking strategies. I've taught the CISP five day class 148 times now, right? But it took me 14 years to do that. Um, and over that time, I've seen a lot of different study techniques, uh, what's worked, what hasn't worked based on the feedback. So I'll give you, you know, what I'm seeing works uh, in terms of a study strategy and what works when you're in front of the computer or in front of the test itself. So that's what I want to cover. Everyone's heard this, right? The common body of knowledge is a mile wide and an inch deep. All right, maybe it's two miles wide and three inches deep, but it's pretty much a lot wider, in other words, a lot more breadth of topics than it is in depth. And the way I teach my classes, I, I tell people, if you're an expert in any one thing in security, I am not going to push your expertise. If you're the firewall administrator, I'm not going to say anything about firewalls that you don't already know. Right? I might use a couple of terms a little bit differently than you use them. Like, we don't call it a DMZ, we call it a screened subnet. Right? So you have to know that vocabulary. And that's what a lot of the CISP is, it's just a vocabulary. What do these terms mean? Uh, because when I explain a lot of them, you go, oh, I get it. I know what segmentation is, separation of duties, and all these different principles. I just didn't know what they call it. I didn't know what that technique was called. So we'll talk about those kind of things. Um, and this shouldn't surprise you. Um, has anyone heard criticism of the CISSP credential? Or heck, any credential, right? All of us in technology, a lot of people will poo-poo you know, credentials saying, you know, just because you're a CCNA doesn't mean you know how to do my network or just because you're CISP doesn't mean you know security. No one said it did, right? In fact, ISC squared themselves just say it's a common body of knowledge. All that means is you and I speak the same language. If you're a CISP and I'm a CISP, I see it in your, on your business card, I might start a conversation about saying two-factor authentication and just keep running because I know you know what two-factor authentication is, I don't have to stop and explain it. We have a common body of knowledge, and that's it. It doesn't mean you know how to write policies, or it doesn't mean you're a QSA, or a firewall engineer, or a forensics analyst, or a pen tester, or any of those kind of things. I don't know those things, because I haven't looked at your resume or talked to you yet. But I do know you know all the terms around all that stuff, right? And that's all it is. All right. Um, Lots of vocabulary, minimal numbers uh, that you'll have to know. 
you do not have to remember any port numbers, you don't have to remember any RFC numbers. As an information security professional, you should know what port 80 is, but it, you won't see it on the test. Um, Security Plus, you'll see that on the test, but on CISSP, you won't see port numbers on test, you won't see RFC numbers, you won't have to know what ISO 15408 is or any of that kind of stuff. Um, there are some numbers, though, right? And the only numbers you need to know on the CISSP are all in physical security, and it's the fence heights ones. If anyone's studied, you know what I'm talking about. Um, a fence that is three to four feet high, you know, the kind you have around your fence, your yard, what's it good for? It's good to deter casual trespassers. It stops a path from being worn in your yard. But if my Frisbee goes on the other side, I'm jumping it. Like, that's all it's good for. And then six to seven feet high, um, uh, deters uh, intruders, and then eight feet high with barbed wire uh, is a serious barrier. These are the only numbers you have to know. That's it. And there's minimal formulas that you have to know. The only formulas that you have to know are the risk formulas. Those of you who were here last time saw some kind of risk formula, but it's um, SLE, single loss expectancy, annual loss expectancy, and something they used to teach called safeguard value, which is just how much money is it worth to put a control. And that's it. So it's not really a remember numbers and remember formulas kind of thing. It's a vocabulary and it's a principle uh, kind of idea. You will have to know your history. And a lot of people in technology kind of think like, look, if we don't use WEP anymore, why should I know anything about WEP? We don't even use WPA anymore. It's all WPA2. So don't ask me any questions about WEP and WPA. Sorry, you're going to get questions about, w, about uh, WEP and WPA. You have to know what is WEP, what was wrong with it, what was WPA, what's wrong with that, and why are we at what WPA2? Right? You have to know all that stuff. You also have to know the orange book, right? Computer <coughs> security criteria. What was that original certification or, or uh, uh, criteria? What was it replaced with? Common criteria. Uh, and why, and what's the differences. Right? So um, you'll have to know all that. Now I get some students who say, now wait a minute, why do I have to know history? And we've all heard the quip, you know, you have to repeat it. But really the way I'll put it is, remember, it's a common body of knowledge. Has anyone ever uh, completed an assessment, done a report, performed a pen test, and then you present it to someone who's in charge of the organization? It happens all the time. Sometimes people in charge of the organization are older, right? So if you do a certification accreditation and you brief the general in charge of the base and, you, and he says, um, yeah, as long as it's C2 level security, I'm okay. And you don't look at them and say, we don't use C2 anymore. It's all common criteria, it's EAL2. No, you say, yes, sir, I know what you're talking about. Right? We have a common body of knowledge. We speak the same language. We know what C2 and B1 and B2 and B3 and A1 and all that stuff is, right? That's what the common body of knowledge is. So don't get surprised that you have to know some history or some older things too. It is useful when you're discussing this. Okay, I believe the best thing, well, one of the ways I describe CISSP is there's probably about 10 or 12,000 things you gotta know, right? And it's really not that hard if you break it down into 10 domains. I'll try to use the class of 10. And 10 domains have about 10 topics in them, and each topic has about 12 things you got to know. Therefore, it's really not that much going on there. Um, but when you learn these things, it, it, it pays to learn them in groups, right? Don't try to learn 10 or 12,000 things. Learn about 100 groups of things, like passwords. Passwords are pretty simple, but you'll have to know the difference between a static password, a dynamic password, a cognitive password. You'll have to know what one-way hashing is. You'll have to know that they should never be stored. You should know what dictionary attacks are and brute force attacks are and rainbow tables. And all that stuff I just said is just one discussion. If you understand passwords, you understand those 12 or 20 concepts around how we select passwords, how we test them, how we implement them, and how they're utilized in systems. So it really pays to understand these things in groups or discussions rather than 12 or 12,000 individual elements. Um, also, look to build mnemonics. How many people in here know the seven layers of the OSI model? And what mnemonic are you using to, to state those? All people seem to need data processing. You just don't like the back of your hand. No mnemonic at all. Social security is another way of 
please do not throw sausage pieces away. My favorite one is um, please do not take salespeople's advice. It's kind of a fun one. But we typically tend to learn these mnemonics, and even though we absolutely understand everything behind it, we hold on to that mnemonic as a way to remember it, right? So don't look down your nose at memory devices and tricks and other ways to um, memorize these things and output them on the text. Um, I'll show you my best ofs, but if anyone has any questions about how to understand something, I can tell you in general how to make up your own mnemonics or sentences or whatever else. And I'll show you a technique that I have called data dump sheet, which really helps you um, bring up from your memory everything that you might use on the test. All right, so um, here's the data dump sheet. Now, this is just my data dump sheet. Um, a data dump sheet is all the little mnemonics and memory devices that you have used or come up with in a very shorthand firm, uh, form that's going to help you on the test. Now, when you sit for the test, they'll give you a uh, 8 by 10 whiteboard and a whiteboard marker. Now, the whiteboard marker is a little fat for this thing, but it's intended so you can do little multiplications and draw things and figure things out. Forget it. Don't use it for that. Use it for a data dump. And what I mean by data dump is my weak spot when I was taking the test the first time was telecommunications and the OSI model. So the first thing I did is I found a blank sheet of paper somewhere, I wrote one through seven, I put all people seeing to need data processing, I started mapping, where does, where does the IP um, protocol go? Uh, where is SSH, where is SSL? And I started mapping it all over the place. I also found out when I'm taking the exam, they would ask me questions like, which of the following VPN technologies is not a level two technology? L2TP, L2F, PPTP and SSL. I was like, okay, SSL is now level two, but all those other ones are. Right? That's what they just told me on the question. So I was able to go back to my diagram and fill it in even more, right? And keep building it through the test. I'll go through these. Um, some of these are so shorthand that you might not know what they're um, representing, but that's the value of your own data dump sheet. In the top left hand corner, that's the OSI stack. What are those four initials to the right of all people seem to need data processing? The A H I N. That's the TCP stack, right? Which covers the same geography, but there are four levels instead of seven. And being able to map it across would be something useful. Uh, there's a virtual addressing. Um, it's one of the more difficult areas inside of security architecture, but it has no different addressing modes and programming. Like Direct addressing is loading the value directly into a memory location, but indirect is loading the place where you can go find the value and put it in the memory location. That's what that's kind of showing you. Um, there's some initials for biometrics, type 1 errors or type 2 errors. Um, there's the most efficient biometrics and the most accepted biometrics. I'll cover that real quick. Uh, this is I think it's useful. You may get a question on the CISSP that lists a bunch of biometric methods. They might even give you a scenario-based questions. Um, scenario-based questions, which will come up in a bit, give you kind of a, a story. So what if the story says something like, it's extremely important in this organization that biometrics are accurate because past um, attempts to identify individuals fell flat, and several logs were showing that multiple people had the same identity, even though we tried to keep it separately. And then we'll say, which of the following biometrics represents the most effective? Right? Kind of a weak scenario question, but you might get something like that. And then it'll list a bunch of biometric methods. The most effective one is retina and iris, right? The stuff about the eyeball. Um, it's even more accurate than fingerprint. You would think fingerprint would be the most accurate, but that's just because it's the most useful in crime. People leave fingerprints when they steal stuff. People don't leave eyeball prints around, right? If they did, that'd be awesome, but uh, it just doesn't happen that way. And then the P is palm scan. Palm scan is actually all the skin on your hand, which includes the fingerprint. So it's more effective than just the fingerprint alone. So it's a real simple little acronym, RIP, like rest in peace, and you can remember that those are the most effective ones. Most effective is not the complete story for biometrics. Anyone uh, implement biometrics in the organization? You put biometrics at the front door of this community college and it's a retina scanner, you think you'd be real popular? 
I don't think you would, right? They might put up with a palm scan or maybe a thumbprint or something like that, but even then, people are going to complain. People complain about biometrics because, hey, I don't want you to have a fingerprint. I don't want to put my eyeball up to a cup that a bunch of other people put their eyeball up to. That's nasty. Right? So they have hygiene concerns. They have privacy concerns. Um, the ones they don't have concerns about are called acceptable, right? So voice -like. We speak all day at work. No one has a problem speaking into a microphone. Uh, signature, right? So you write your signature. We do this all the time at the stores. Um, uh, hand geometry, that's when you put your hand not on a plate of glass. It does not look at your skin. But you put it on a piece of plastic or metal, and it looks at your bone structure. Does anyone care about the privacy of the bone structure of their hand? Right? You're, you're pretty anal about privacy if you do. Um, and the last one is keystroke dynamics. Right? How you type the keys and how fast. Now those aren't very effective. Right? Keystroke dynamics is pretty poor in biometrics, but no one's going to complain about having to type. Right? We do the work all the time. So real simple new models, RIP and WISH, I guess it's pronounced like that, will help you separate the effectiveness um, and the acceptability. So this is just an example of all the kinds of mnemonics that you can create. There's the uh, equations. Whoops. There's the equations that I said you had to know: ALE, uh, SLE, and uh, Sator value. The numbers you need to know in physical. There's the fence heights and the lighting and humidity. Uh, you'll have to know the types of fire: type A fires, type B fires, type C fires. If you're in the Navy, you know this. If you don't know this, I use mnemonics called ash barrel and circuit. Wood leaves an ash, right? So common combustibles are type A fires. Uh, liquids are stored in barrels, so uh, liquid fires are type B. And uh, electrical fires, C stands for circuit. Electrical fires are, are C fires. So just an example of a bunch of different ways to create mnemonics. Um, I'll show you some other mnemonics through the rest of my slides, but I want to bring you through a couple of the domains and I just want to show you the top level of some stuff you might not want to know. I usually speak about four hours on each domain, so it's impossible to them all. Um, before I get to that, let me talk about the, the common body of knowledge for 2015. Um, you guys might have seen this. Has anyone read it? So IC Squared put it out and said, here's the new common body of knowledge. There's eight. You read it. You knew there were eight. Right? Yeah. Thick, yeah. Well, hey, at least they're giving us more information on what's in the CBK than they did before, right? Before they didn't really tell us much what's in there, right? Those of us who teach, it was throwing a real monkey wrench because now my 10 domains, I got to redo all my slides and make eight domains. Because if you were a student of mine and I thought the 10 domains, you'd be like, hey, what gives? Didn't it change to eight? What I'd really tell you is it didn't really change at all because I'm, I'm revamping my course. I've added eight slides out of about 1,200. I'm gonna to have to shuffle the heck out of them, and it's a real pain, but I've added eight slides, and I could easily teach you in the same 10 domains all the stuff you need to know. Yeah, I, I've read some, I, I don't remember if it was information leaked or somebody LinkedIn, or I, I don't know, blog, or something. It's, a, it's the same information. Pretty much. I shuffled around and updated it just a little bit. Got rid of some really, really old stuff that was outdated. Yeah. Whatever it was, 10 years ago, when they had a big black and yellow one, just kind of changed the right up a little bit and they carried down eight things. Really awesome. Yeah, I would say it, it didn't, it's not necessary to restudy because it came out, right? Everything you studied or known already, you're, you're good, right? You might want to get an updated book when they come out, but the first updated book that's going to come out is Guess Who's? IC Squared. It's the worst book out there. Uh, at least the previous versions of that for studying for the exam. This was not bad to read. I'm not happy to do the first uh, version of the domain. It's a tech book, but it's, it's easier to read than the old, the previous. Good. Before. And this is it's important. There was actually, was in another session, there's actually a crosswalk in the areas of links to that NIST uh, standard. One, you know, there's a uh, crosswalk between the uh, actual links and the other one in the NIST. Cool. Yeah. Here's here's what I saw that was new, just real high level that wasn't in the old ones. A um, little bit expanded on third party risk management. 
that's the target uh, influence. Um, BYOD risk were talked about before, but I didn't see it in any of their books before. So it's been in there. The Internet of Things is discussed. I don't know what's security relevant about that other than stuff is connected. Um, Software-defined networks is new. That wasn't in there before, so that is new. Uh, cloud identity services like OAuth 2.0, that's new. Um, but you know, maybe 4%. It's really not a whole lot new. There's a couple of things you need to know, but not a whole lot. And I think you could get it out of um, just picking up the IC squared bulletin that if you didn't get it, you can get it from the website or Google. And then just click in links or Googling those terms. Google software defined networks and read it on the wiki. It'll get you what you need to know. Right. So it's not that big of a deal. I wouldn't get overly concerned if there's a new PBK. It's not like everything's brand new. Okay, here's my quick pass at some of the top domains and some of the top areas that you might want to ask me questions about. And this is where it becomes a little bit directed by you, because really the title of this should be everything you always wanted to know about the new CPK. So if you don't want to know anything, I don't really have anything to add to this slide. Right? Let me know what you want to know. But here's the stuff that you've always needed to know about access control. Access control is mostly vocabulary. There's some technologies. You need to know how kryptonite and sesame work, but it's mostly knowing the vocabulary. What is a threshold? What's a cognitive password? What's a passphrase versus a passphrase? What's strong authentication? Knowing about identity management and these protocols. Understanding the difference between Mac and DAC and RBAC. Pretty much the kind of stuff that's in access control. Any questions about that? I don't have too many mnemonics on that. Yes? Yeah, so um, a, a hash is just we never store passwords in, in the uh, plain text. So those are two separate things, right? They're not really. Um, so uh, a hash is just the representation of the password that is one way encrypted stored. Um, a, a, yep, and a threshold is um, how many uh, times are you going to be able to type in the wrong password before you get locked out? Just a threshold. And in fact, um, sometimes they use a different word than threshold. They use the word clipping level. Most people probably haven't heard the word clipping level. Right? So that would be uh, a cognitive. Um, they call it a cognitive password, but rarely is it ever used as a password. It's used as a security question. So, which of these four addresses have you never been associated with? You don't have to memorize anything. You were just like, I've never lived in Kansas City. I know that it's cognitive. Right, so that's a cognitive password. And it can be fact or opinion, but you just know it. Opinion would be something like, what's your least favorite vegetable? If I ask you that today and I ask you that next month, you're very likely to give the same answer. So those are cognitive. Computer architecture. Computer architecture uh, has the computer science 101, so you'll have to know all about the CPU, the ALU, the FPU, the bus, the caches, how caching works, how addressing works. Um, memory management, process management, thread management. Like I said, it's computer science 101. You got to know all that stuff. On top of that, you have to understand computer security 101. So what is security relevant about process management? Keeping this process from affecting what's on this process. That's setting up covert channels. You need to understand that. You also need to understand security models. You might have something about models in here. The Bella Padula, the Clark Wilson, the Biva, the non-interference, all of those. You'll need to understand system evaluation. That's common criteria and the old orange book, enterprise architecture, and architectural threats. This is basically what you'll need to know for, for a computer architecture. Here's the model slide that I typically show people. Now, don't be concerned if you don't completely understand models from this one slide. It usually takes me about 20 slides and 45 minutes to describe models, but if you've already learned models to some extent, I like putting everything on one piece of paper. Like, what's the difference between the Bella Padula and the Bible model? Well, they're kind of flipped. Bella Padula is no read up, no write down. Bible is the opposite of that. And if you've done a little bit of studying on Bella Padula and Bible, you'd be like, ah, I get it, right? And it helps you compare things. I also put up the non-interference of Clark Wilson and the information flow. And there's a lot of abbreviations here, but if you've done a half an hour or an hour studying of reading those uh, models, uh, you'll have a good indication. Anyone having trouble with models, you've read a book and you're still not getting it, I have a great recommendation. Anyone in that predicament? 
There's a book out there by Maury Gasser, M-O-R-R-I-E and Gasser, G-A-S-S-E-R. It's out of print. Um, and so the rights reverted back to the author and he put it out there for free. So you can download the PDF for free. If you do a Google for it, the first thing that shows up is from China. I wouldn't go there, right? Uh, I would go to the U.S. University and download that. I have no idea. I haven't done any analysis. I just think you can lessen your risk by grabbing the second one. And uh, it's called Building a, a Secure Computing System. So if you just use the word like building, secure, computer, and gasser, PDF, you'll find it. And it's free, and it's the best description I've ever seen of models. I created all my slides off of his book. Um, the other books, it's clear that the authors never did models before, um, and it's kind of hard to read. But that Gasser book is awesome. You read? Yeah. How do you spell the last name? G A S S E R. Um, it's, a, it's a great book, and read the first two or three chapters of that. You'll get a really good indication, and this chart will make a lot of sense. Cryptography. I came up with this slide like only two years ago. Um, how many people have studied cryptography pretty well and think they're ready for that part of the test? It's one of the harder things to study for the CISSP. Um, what I found when I was doing review sessions for cryptography is you are ready to take the CISP if the following sentences that I say make sense to you. Right? There are three general types of cryptography. Symmetric, asymmetric, and hashing. You should understand that. If you don't understand that, you've got to read the chapter and get it, right? Within each one of those things, you could be asked the question, which of the following is a hashing algorithm, which of the following is a symmetric algorithm, which of the following is an asymmetric algorithm. I have a great mnemonic for that. The mnemonic is called Dear Miss Carbids. I don't know if it's up there or not. But Dear stands for, uh, where is it? Debbie Hellman, Elgamal, ECC, and RSA. Right, so D-E-E-R gives you four of the most popular asymmetric algorithms. Carbids is just a long, nonsense word that gives you a whole bunch of symmetric algorithms, uh, like CAST, ABS, RC family, Blowfish, IDEA, um, and DES and SAFER. That would make a word carbids. And the misses is just the MRS, it's the three popular hashing algorithms. So if you come up with that mnemonic, you'd be able to answer all those questions. The next thing I noticed is um, symmetric encryption itself has, a, has some services. And basically, symmetric just means the same key is used to encrypt as it to decrypt. So it's very good for storing a secret but i got to get the darn key to somebody. Right? It doesn't solve that problem. But it's very good for what we call bulk encryption. Asymmetric encryption was, it is designed to give the key to somebody. Put those two things together, and you have something. What is it called? Um, it's called hybrid encryption. right? And you will use asymmetric encryption to get the key to someone in the field, but once they get the key, they're not going to continue to use asymmetric encryption because asymmetric encryption is very slow. So let's say someone's off in Afghanistan and they take a bunch of 10 megapixel pictures of mountain passes and they want to get it over here for analysis, um, but they ran out of keys. You can use asymmetric encryption to get a 256 ADS key over to them and the enemy will never see it. That's just how asymmetric works. Once you get it over there, which is a little bit of work, but it's only a 256-bit payload, big deal, right? Once you get it over there, then you want to switch to ADS and move that huge file on. You wouldn't want to move a huge file with asymmetric, it's too slow. So putting those two pieces together gives you hybrid encryption. The other cool thing is we've got three different types of encryption. Putting any two together gives you something. And that, that's the question I would ask Reed of you, right? If you think you're ready to take the CISP for crypto, I would ask you, take any two of, name me the three big areas, name me the, the the um, protocols or algorithms in each of those areas, and tell me what happens when you put those two together, or these two together, or these two together. And the answer is all in this sixth bubble here. Asymmetric and symmetric gives you hybrid. Um, digital signature is just hashing like an email, making it small, and then using asymmetric to sign it. Right? And it's different than the hybrid encryption. And then keyed hash is what you get when you take a hash and symmetric. 
If you don't understand that yet, you will after you read the cryptography chapter, but it's a real good check to see if you're ready to take the crypto. And it's all in one slide, which is nice. I like that. Any questions on crypto? Can't possibly cover it all in, in one slide, but it's a good uh, pulse check if you're ready. All right, let's see what else we got. Telcom, this is a really busy chart, but this is just my chart that I started making, saying, gosh, if I had this in front of me when I was taking the exam, I'd be all set. And I just started building it. ISC Square does not to date, now maybe use this in their new book, how come they don't tell us, here's all the protocols and where we map them. Mapping protocols is problematic because some protocols bridge different levels and some protocols don't say where they're at. Like, well, SSH and SSL, right? Both of those bridge different uh, different levels, but where would ISC squared say it sits at? They typically say where the majority secure, where the major security function sits and operates. That's typically where they map it. Now I know the nerds in the room will say, "Wait a minute, you can't do that without doing a level four thing." So it's a level four. It's like, don't worry about it. ISC squared puts it to level five, so it's level five. I just learn what they do. So this is my big chart of that. Uh, legal, I went ahead and put this chart up there. Uh, legal, you'll have to know, I think one of, the, one of the areas that's a little bit difficult is understanding intellectual property. What's the difference between copyright and trademark and trade secret and patent? And I put up in one chart all the differences there. There's some complexities there. One of the things I think is really interesting, and I don't know if IC Squared's updated it yet. Um, the US, two years ago, was the only country in the world to recognize first to invent, not first to file. First to file means if you invented a new encryption algorithm and you told me about it and I ran to the patent office faster than you did, I get it. And that is true everywhere in the world except in the US. If you can prove, no, 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 he did beat me to the patent office, but I invented this first, they would reverse the patent and give it back to you in the US. That stopped March 16th of last year with the American Invents Act. The American Invents Act brought the US in line with everyone else in the world, and now it's first to file everywhere in the world now. Right? I don't know if ISC Squared updated it yet, right? Probably. But um, before um, April 15th, I was saying no, they didn't update it yet. Yeah. No, I think it would be whatever the law was at the time. But uh, there's a lot of interesting stuff there, like fair use and dilution and distinctiveness. Um, but legal is a fun thing to, to talk about. Um, I showed you this slide of, of operations um, because this is something most all of us will know. Uh, we all know what a penetration test is. But do you know the five elements of the penetration test, right? According to ISC squared, a pen test goes through these five elements, and you'll have to know that. If they say, what's the third stage of pen testing, you've got to know it's vulnerability mapping. That's just, that's one of the things in the CISSP that you might not think is fair. You're like, wait a minute, I'm a pen tester. I know it better than these guys. I do it in eight stages, and it's better. That may be so, but you want to learn these five stages. Whenever you need to learn something in order, your mnemonic has to stay in order, right? It can't just be any one of these things. So what I did is I took a keyword for each one of these areas and the first letter of the keyword, and I called it, I called that first one discovery, and I created the word Denver. If you take the E and the N from enumeration, then you get the word Denver, and that's really easy to memorize. So if you have the word Denver in your head and you write it out like that and ask you the third stage, if you forgot, you know it starts with a V. That's probably good enough to get you there. Right? So these kind of mnemonics are really helpful. I would say anytime you have to learn um, a phase, like disaster recovery has phases, change management has phases, pen testing has phases, risk assessment has phases, you'll want a mnemonic for it. Right? So you know what those phases are. All right, um, that's my quick, quick overview of the 10 domains. I just picked like five or six of them and showed you kind of some of the best of slides and mnemonics to give you the idea of what do I mean by mnemonics and why it's so important to come up with them. Let me show you what the, the test questions look like and, and what they're, they're new. Well, um, these slides my 
typo. Sorry, I, I typed it this morning. I started typing this last night, but I had a really nice margarita, and I decided to finish it uh, this morning. I must have got a last night one. Okay, so the majority of the questions are, it's one question. One to two sentences, four candidate answers, pick one. So you got a 25% chance of guessing right. Uh, that's just going to be my basis for describing the other questions. Any kind of test bank that you use to test yourself, you're going to want your test bank to look just like that. Test banks with answers A through J aren't going to get you used to what the test is going to look like. So most test banks are just like that, and that's what they are. They've added a couple of new things. The scenario question, the drag and drop, and something they call the hot box. It's called the hot spot. So a scenario question. These have been around like three or four years. And a scenario question is just a paragraph, maybe two, that describes a scenario. The example I've always seen is typically like, you're a new security officer at X, like at a bank. Uh, they'll usually describe something that's happened in the past, like you failed an audit, or there hasn't been much spending in security, or something like that. And then they'll ask you a series of questions. Now, one of the questions they'll ask would be something like, which one of the following security policies would be most effective in your organization, or which ones would not? Well, they described a bank, not a military organization. So mandatory access control is right out. Right? And then they'll probably put a fake thing, like, I don't know, TBAC or something like that. That's not really an access control policy, and that would be out. And they want you to say DAC. Right? Um, that's a scenario-based question. So it's a, uh, it's a description of an area, and then we'll ask you like three to five questions on it. My tactic for that is read the question first. Um, and this can be demonstrated. I'll demonstrate this real quickly, right? Um, let me give you a question that has nothing to do with security. But let's see how good you are at answering that. Pretend you're a bus driver and you've got to get up at 4.15 in the morning and you'd like to warm the bus up for 20 minutes before you leave. When you leave, uh, it takes you five minutes to get to the first stop. It's one mile away. You pick up three kids. It takes you seven minutes to get to the next stop. You pick up two more kids. Uh, and that's a half mile away. It takes you 10 minutes to get to the third stop. You drop off one and pick up three, and that's two miles away. And then you finally arrive at the school, which is three miles away and 20 minutes later. Um, what color are the eyes of the bus driver? <laughs> so you know the answer. Does anyone know the answer? So what was the first thing I said? You are the bus driver. So it's just a riddle, right? You try to gloss over that and fool people and get them to do things in their head. But if we applied this to that scenario question, you wouldn't be fooled at all. You'd see all this information, and a lot of it is superfluous, stuff you don't need. You'd look at the question. Where's the question mark? What color are the eyes of the bus driver? You haven't spent much time on the rest of that. You haven't added anything up. You go back into the question, and you look at what's relevant. How am I going to find out the color of the eyes? I don't care about miles or numbers of students or, or anything else, and there it is. You can do the same thing with the scenario question. Skip all the bank officer stuff, and then just read the question. Which security policy is most effective here? Ah, let me go back up and pull the information out. A lot of times, you'll be able to answer the question without reading the scenario at all. I've seen scenario questions. They're quite bad. But it says, based on... I don't know, based on the way you want to set up uh, a field office, asymmetric encryption is going to be needed. Which of the following algorithms is asymmetric? I don't need the scenario for that question, right? I'm done. I'm not going to waste any time for that. So look for the question first, then go back up and pull the information out. It's really not that hard. I think they're tripping over themselves for those ones. Also consider operational issues. They're looking for trade-offs. They're looking for things like... You don't want to lock everything down. Like, one-factor authentication, good. Two-factor, better. Three-factor, best. Not always, right? Just because we can make people put in three different pieces of information before they get access to the system doesn't mean we should. And they're looking for those kinds of trade-offs. They're tougher questions to ask, but be ready to have trade-offs. It's not always the most secure. They'll typically say which one will best fit or which one is ideal, or which one is reasonable, or something like that. They won't say which one's most secure, right? Because that's a different question. And know the difference. This is a drag and drop, right? Now, I didn't program this. This is just a static slide. Nothing's going to move here. But drag and drop basically says which algorithms below are examples of symmetric cryptography. Now, if you remember my mnemonic, how many people remember 
the mnemonic for the different types. Dear Miss Carbids, the big word Carbids is all symmetric because there's a lot of symmetric algorithms. So anything with one of those are, are symmetric. Well, which one of those are symmetric? This is basically five true or false questions. That's what it is, right? So AES, true or false, is symmetric. It is symmetric, so that's true. So you would click on the mouse and you would drag it and you would drop it into the box. Uh, RSA, true or false, is symmetric. False, it's asymmetric. 50 Hellman is asymmetric, Helmut Mall is asymmetric, so those are both false. And then finally, DES, true or false, it is symmetric. So you would basically grab the first one and the last one and you would drag them independently over and drop them and you would get two out of two points. The scoring's a little weird here, right? So normally you've got, when you have four choices, pick one, you get one point for getting that question right. Here we have five choices, true and false. Turns out two of them are true, and if you get both true, then you get both points. A little bit different scoring. Here, let me, let me put you at ease. How does this change your study? None, right? None at all. You just have to know what a drag and drop is. I wouldn't worry about how much it's weighted or any of that kind of stuff. You either know it or you don't. It's not going to change your studying. Um, but that's a drag and drop. This next one's kind of funky. Um, I think it's kind of challenging. Uh, the diagram below is a design of a public key infrastructure to secure the internet transactions. Within the design is a CA, an RA, and a VA. So first of all, you got to know what a certificate authority is, a registration authority, and a validation authority. Um, click on the location where the registration authority is. Now, let me give you the quick what, what those things are. Certificate authority, that's the root. That's the one that gives out the certificate. A registration authority offloads some of the stuff that the CA does. So it might do the initial user registration, but the CA is the one that issues the certificates. And a validation authority is once you hit a website like Amazon and you get a certificate, if you want to know it's valid, you're talking to the validation authority. So given that, and maybe you know what these pictures are meaning here, where is the registration authority? It's in the upper right hand corner. Basically what you see is you see a user, the user talks to the registration authority. The user doesn't talk directly to the certification authority nor the validation authority. It's the shopping cart that talks to the validation authority, and it's the CA in the middle that issues the certificate. I actually went on the IC Squared website, took their hot box example, which is this picture, and I changed the words up above. Their question was, where's the CA? The CA is in the middle. The VA is down below. That's an interesting question, right? I don't think it's going to change your study. You still need to know about what a PKI is, what a CA, a VA, and an RAR, but you should be used to this kind of question. If you never saw this kind of question before and you're sitting on the computer, it might throw you. So it does pay to know what these things look like. Go online, take a couple of these example questions. I don't think it's going to change your studying, but you do want to make sure you're familiar with these. The last part of my talk is study strategies and test taking strategies. So while you're studying for the test, a lot of people will ask me how they plan on studying. Well, what I say is register for the test first. When are you going to take it? Usually when I'm teaching a class, I tell people four to six weeks after the class is over. So if you're taking a five-day class, four to, four to six weeks after the five-day class is about right for most people. Depends on your workload, your vacation, your everything else. But you probably want to have between 40 and 100 hours after a five-day class to continue to study. Rough. In order to do that, you want to get on the website and register for the class. This is going to hold your feet to the fire, right? Now you have a date on the calendar, and you can divide how many days between now and then to study. And I do something called the rule of 12. Maybe I need to change it to the rule of 10 now. But it's basically um, one set of days for every domain of 10. And then two of those same sets of days for just doing big tests. So if I'm going to take it a month from now, I would study two days on every domain, and I would study four days of just taking big tests. And make sure you take big tests. We tend to just double check. I just read a chapter. I think I know this. I'll take 20 questions. I got 18 right. I'm good. Probably. Um, 
But if the first time you ever sit for 250 questions is the exam itself, you're not quite ready, right? Because it's a little bit of a marathon to sit for three hours taking a test. And you don't want the first time you ever do that to be the real test. So take at least two full-length exams before you sit for the exam. Um, utilize all the sources you can. Create your own mnemonic. Read lots of books. Go on websites. Take a class. Go to a study group. Um, try not to focus on just one single way to study, like one person's book or something like that. The more different directions you get it from, the better you understand it. Um, if you're taking a course uh, like the Global Knowledge, you'll get access to Transcender and their own courses. If you buy a book, you'll get a CD in the back. There's lots of sources for questions, so utilize all of them. Also, mix it up. Don't take the same questions over and over again. If you've taken the same set of 50 questions on cryptography and the 10th time you took it, you memorized the answers and you did got an 85, that might not mean you're ready yet for the test. So get some other sources. Um, use memory devices. Make sure, for especially for those areas that are real hard to study, come up with acronyms like Dear Mrs. Carbids, um, Please Do Not Pick, pick Salespeople's Advice, Plain Brown Potatoes Raised Plain Thin Men. That's a... a business continuity and a disaster recovery one for the phases of business continuity. Um, send me an email if you want to see it. Uh, other mnemonics uh, I use, like uh, I use something called the Lincoln Tunnel. It's a way to remember is link or end-to-end -end encryption associated with tunnel or transport mode? Well, you can probably guess which one's associated with, with which on that, but link uh, and tunnel mode are the same. Um, I also have some diagrams that you saw up on my data dump sheet. Concentric squares was just a thing in the middle that showed the security kernel is the implementation of the reference monitor concept, which sits inside the trusted computing base, which sits inside the security perimeter, and it's a way of understanding all those concepts. So as much as possible, come up with these memory devices. The day before the test, um, you're probably going to take the test, well, you will be taking the test in a Pearson View Pro, uh, um, testing center. You may have never been to it, right? And sometimes those things are hard to find. They're in strip malls. They're in warehouse-looking places. You don't want to be driving up five minutes before your test trying to figure out where is Sweet Page. You can't find it, right? Drive by it the day before. Go touch the door. Peek your head and Make sure you know exactly where to go and be on time, right? Um, if you bite into your six hour window which you've reserved uh, at the place they'll still let you in but you're going to be a little bit off right because you're like shoot I lost a half hour of my time uh, and you're not going to sit well for the exam so don't put yourself up against that kind of stuff. By the way you don't need six hours to take the test right? nobody's going to take more than four hours and you've got a six hour window so you're fine. I like to reduce anxiety as much as possible for the test taking don't worry about the time. How do you remove your own anxiety for the time instead of just taking my word for it? Well, I said, take some full life exams, time yourself. Anytime you take more than 100 questions, write the time it is that you start and write the time it is when you end, including bathroom breaks and stretch breaks and everything. You will see that you're answering a question about once every 20 to 30 seconds, which is more than enough time to take the exam. 30 seconds is basically four hours and 10 minutes to take the whole exam, right? And you'll be, you'll be fine. 60 seconds then, yeah, so you'll be fine. Uh, the day of the exam, uh, know that they really lock down these testing centers. You'll literally have to turn your pockets inside out. You'll have to do this and say, no, I got nothing, right? So don't bring in a thumb drive and don't bring in a digital watch or an Apple watch if you have one, right? None of that stuff's allowed. You can have yeah, you can have an analog watch like that, um, but that's it, um, and you'll you'll go in. Now you can bring snacks like a bottle of water and a power bar and prescriptions, but they'll put it on a table in the back that you're allowed to go to and drink from. You're allowed to go to the bathroom, but it cuts into your time. Your time, your clock keeps running, but you're allowed to leave and come back. I would bring a jacket or a sweater or a hoodie or something because you don't know if it's going to be hot or cold, especially if you're there on a weekend versus a weekday. Um, the temperatures go up and down a lot in office buildings, so you just want to be comfortable. Other possible issues, um, sometimes you can't help it. Sometimes they're in a strip mall or a warehouse and someone's doing construction next door. Right? 
just be ready for everything. Uh, I bring ear earplugs. You never know if you're going to need them. Very lightweight, not a big deal. Um, when they give you the whiteboard and the whiteboard marker, make sure it's a good one. It should be clean. Um, it shouldn't have that gray gook behind it. Your marker should be sharp and legible because you're going to try to get as much data dump information as possible on there. You're paying $600 to sit for this exam. It is fine to say, I want a fresh whiteboard and a fresh marker. By the way, Pearson View doesn't really give you a whiteboard. It's a legal size sheet of paper that's laminated. And the back side is black. So they've actually pulled off the one-sided sheet of paper. You can't write on the back and actually see what you've written. You only have one side. The data dump strategy is just writing down, um, before you answer any questions, writing all down all your mnemonics and your drawings. Um, I would consider the three-pass method you don't have to, but um, if you're reading a question and it's just too problematic for you and it's throwing you off your game, skip it and go to the next one. Then come back and do those, and then come back for a final pass for the real tough ones. It keeps track of all those. You can flag them. You can review them. It makes sure that you put some answer before you submit your test. So don't worry. They know what they're doing in the interface, and I'll show you what it looks like. For every single question, now how many people have taken a lot of questions already studying for this history? Does anyone? When you do, you will find that you have some dumb answers. Right? In other words, you'll, you'll miss it, you'll go back and read it, you go, oh, I didn't see the word not there. Or, oh, I thought that said symmetric instead of asymmetric. That's a dumb answer. You knew it, but you missed it. Slow down. When we're reading information for work, we tend to read real fast. Because a paragraph could really be summarized in a sentence. We say the same thing three times. And everything reinforces itself. A question is compact. And it's even meant to almost have a turn in it. Like they'll take a definition and they'll remove a word or change a word. So every single word in that sentence is very, very important. And you've got to take a different kind of reading stance than you normally do in everyday work. So move your finger across it, slow down, hear it in your head. Whatever you have to do, that will reduce the dumb answers. Right? But you want to do something like that to slow it down. Make sure you read all the candidate answers. Right? When you're reading that, it says, you know, which of the following is the first thing you should do when creating a disaster recovery plan? And then the first candidate answer says, understand all your resources and budget. And you're like, oh, that's it. Of course that's the first thing I would do. Right? And you answer A, and you hit next question. You just missed it. Because D was obtain senior management approval. That's the first thing. And you might not have been thinking that until you read it. So make sure you read every candidate answer before you answer the question. Um, sometimes they'll get you there. You can also use candidate answers as clues. Look for any slight difference. They do this a lot in vocabulary type questions. Like if they say, what's the definition of a risk assessment? They'll have four candidate answers that are all definitions, and you're like, I'm not sure which one is which. First thing you want to do is look for what word is, is in every one of those, and which one uh, is only in three of them, or which word is only in two of them. And now you've got, okay, these are the key differences. I don't have to know the definition of security risk assessment. I just have to know, is this one right, or is this one right? right? So you just look at those two things. You can do the same thing with phases. What if it says, um, what are the five phases of a pen test? Now, those of you who memorize the mnemonic might get it. But if it says, in order, which of the following candidate answers has the right uh, phases in order? If you know nothing about risk assessment, and you see the first phase is send report to management, is there something wrong with that definition? You can't possibly send the report before it's even been written. Right? So just look for some obvious problems with the phases. This has to come before that, um, and you can, you can delete some of the candidate answers and get a lot of information from there. So look for that, too, in those phase-type questions. Uh, individual, um, you will see there's information in other questions, and you can update your data dump. Um, also, don't get in the habit of arguing. Um, IC squared tends to use really classic definitions of things. For example, if it says, uh, what if it says uh, firewalls uh, can respond to incidents? No, that's not a good one. Antivirus, uh, yeah. Uh, antivirus software 
um, uh, will respond to incidences and can be corrected. Is that true? It is. I can't think of a single antivirus engine that can't correct something. They can detect things and they can correct it somehow, right? Uh, but some IDSs don't correct. It depends on which mode you put it in, right? So you just got to dumb it down and it's that kind of level. Now, you might be an expert and you're saying, wait, I work with an IDS every day and it responds to things. Therefore, they're wrong. Be careful. They're talking about what the classic definition of, a, of an IDS, and just because you're working with one that does something doesn't mean they all do that. So take it a level up and just talk about what the topic is instead of what your expertise is. We did talk about drag and drop. Those are essentially just a matching exercise. I think they're, no, they're easier than normal questions because it's just a true-false for each individual question. Um, Make the, the simplest and most obvious match first if you, uh, if you go to that. Scenario questions, make sure you go back and find the questions and then the relevant data. And I'm just going to finish it out with uh, showing you what the Pearson View screen looks like. Uh, this is off of their website. I didn't hack in or anything. Um, and it just gives you, I want you to understand that you always will see how much time you have remaining. Right? So you, you might not have a clock in there or your own watch, but it shows you how much time you have left on the exam. And it also allows you to flag it for review later, whether or not you indicated an answer. So in this example, someone believes it's toast with leftovers from the night before is the right answer for a common school snack in England, but they want to flag it to return as well. You can do both. You can flag it with or without answering. Um, this shows the review section. So you see on the very bottom there, um, it shows, well, first of all, um, halfway down, it shows the nine questions, and it shows that three of them are incomplete. I have a green arrow showing one of those questions. You can just click question six and say, I want to review that one. You could um, say, uh, end review, and it's going to put, if you, what if happens if you skip some questions and you forget to go back and answer? This is going to happen. It's going to go, well, wait a minute. you got three questions in here. You didn't even give it a shot. You might want to fill those out. Are you sure? Be real careful. If you ever get this screen, make sure it says, are you sure you want to end this review? You do not want to end this review. You want to go back and answer them. Hopefully you don't get this question, but uh, it, it tries to make sure that you don't send it about things done. And that's all I had for covering it as fast as I could in an hour. Um, any areas of CISSP exam that I didn't cover that someone has some questions for? Yes? I'm sorry, deep, how deep are the questions on what topic? So, I don't know. It's a brand new topic. I saw in their bulletin that SDMs are a new part of it. So I'm going to create my slide set just on the PDF that they sent out and the book that they come up. But uh, we've yet to have a trial of that one. So that was awesome. Any other questions? Are there any uh, training classes here in North Texas that you recommend? Um, hmm. In terms of any cost, that I'd cost recommend. Value, you know? I used to teach for global knowledge. I can't recommend them anymore because I don't teach for them anymore. Um, I'm teaching one in Austin in June. Uh, I'm trying to get with ISSA, you guys could talk to Bill Peterson about that, to teach one here. Um, who else teaches them in North Texas? Oh, I have one. Okay, yeah. Yeah, David mentioned this morning that it doesn't have to be $5. There you go, that's a cheap one. But that's, that's not the continuing education one, that's the regular college. The college one, right. And you might be able to find some, some study groups as well. A lot of um, ISSA, IC Squared, um, OWASP, who knows, uh, other security groups might just say, hey, let's all get together one weekend, you're going to run, you're going to talk about cryptography, the next weekend you're going to do computer architectures. And we just figure it out. That's exactly. Education also has this course, Chuck Eastman, who runs a terrible Okay. Well, what what is one's prospect for passing this if you just apply the marks and study uh, rigorously? And you have five years experience in security? Yes. If you buy the book, study, and put in 80 hours, um, and you have five years experience, and 
Uh, at the end of every chapter, you take at least 50 questions and you're getting 85s, maybe 5 percent right. I'd say you probably got about a 80, 90 percent chance of passing. So there is value in taking the courses. Taking the course, it's really nice to have other students that it bounces around. It's nice to have a block of time that you're dedicated, and it's nice to be forced through the understanding of that. And you can also ask someone else, hey, wait a minute, I understand this, but I don't understand that. You can't do that with a book. So all those things kind of help. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I believe it's all shared out. But if, if not, okay. Yeah, if, if not, send me a note. But it's, it's going to be on there. I have cards up here if anyone wants to keep in touch. But thank you very much, and good luck on your exam. Thank you.